This is exactly right. an exit there, there's two back there, and of course there's one right over there. House, there you go. House right, stage left. There you go. And of course we brought the, the, the rug that my great-grandmother <laughs> wove on a loom. Yes, this is uh, yeah. the Kilgara family rug. Uh, it was handed down from uh, Galway, Ireland, all the way down to... Uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> God bless. It's just gorgeous, and it's... And then I just spilled my nail polish <laughs> that I just painted, literally just painted my nails with backstage. George and I say a pre-show prayer. This is the insider information for locals only. <laughs> and this is not a joke, because they're like, you guys are atheists. No, no, we really say a prayer. We really say a prayer. Tonight we said a prayer to the oceans and the local manicurists. Yep. Um, we just yep. kind of start talking... And then at some point, someone goes, amen. Yeah. And so I just painted my nails, and she went to grab my hands. I well, like, no, 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 no. know we actually started the prayer. All right. And then I went to say something. <laughs> we, were like, we were like trying to be fake spiritual. It's what we do. And <laughs> at one point, I went to say something. And she just goes, watch the fingers. <laughs> <laughs> As much for me, because I don't give a shit. No, obviously. it's for the show. You're right. It's for the people. No, I don't want it to get all over your hands. You oh, see. these old things? <laughs> Look at th- My hands are covered in pen and worry. <laughs> it's some, fine. Some, like, sun damage some, here. Yeah, some gap jeans die because I'm not, never not going like this. <laughs> mm. Oh, no, murder. <laughs> Well, it's great to be here in San Diego. <laughs> That's my segue. That was my segue. Is this new? Did you just write I this? I just wrote this. Is this going to be your new thing? This is my new thing. I lean. Oh, now. my God. This is local Georgia. Yep. You're from nearby. I'm from nearby. I like you guys better than my hometown. <laughs> Don't tell them. Not me. <laughs> NorCal all the way. All right. Oh, thank you. No, I like NorCal better than my hometown too. Oh, so. oh. We're, everyone's happy. Let's let's rate the entire United States <laughs> right now. Um, the last time I was in San Diego actually was for Comic Con. You've been, and I got in a huge screaming fight with my friend in either the Gaslight or the Gas Lamp District, and I. J- Either the gaslight or the... I can't hear anything. <laughs> I bet you it's, um, it's the gas lamp district because the gas light dr- district right. is where people take you to convince you that your thoughts are wrong. Right. Which is what Don't go we there. got in a fight about. Don't go there. That's what... Ha- she was doing that. She was <laughs> gas lamping me in the <laughs> gas light. <laughs> she gas lamped the shit out of you. Yeah, we're friends now. It's fine. But if anyone witnessed it, congratulations. <laughs> Remember that private memory of Georgia's that none of us were there for? <laughs> well, that's just the last memory I have of San Diego, so I'm really happy that this is the last one now. Yes, when I, because you're make, we're making new memories right. all the time. Right. Oh, I got San it. Diego? Oh, I went, went to Bilbo with Theater instead of I got in a screaming fight, you know what I mean? Yeah. The last time I was here, I just had a really mediocre set of comedy, so I also apologize <laughs> for my last... My last experience here in San Diego, I didn't deliver any of the goods. I mean, they should apologize to you. I feel really, the same because you probably brought it. Am I wrong? I brought it in my special way that only certain people <laughs> would care about. Luckily, I've accessed that audience now. Um, <laughs> we found them back in 20, uh, 2008. Nobody was having it. It was a different time. It was a different time. New in material. Country. That's right. All this, you know. It, I don't want to look, but are my Spanx past my knees right now? It fe- that's what it feels like. Let's all be friends and tell her. Oh, no, they're right there. Okay. 
I gave up on those motherfuckers a long time ago. <laughs> I, th- I thought I had Capri Spanks on for a second. <laughs> knee highs? It scared me. Knee high Spanks? Knee high Spanks. Why isn't that a thing? So I, some girls and guys hate their calves. Right? That's true. Knee high Spanks. Yeah, you. Oh my God, calf only Spanks might be a niche that we get rich off. Steven, cut that. Steven, that's, that's ours. ours. Send that's it. ours. Send it in the mail. Oh, there is you want to see Steven? Oh, yeah. Come on. I don't know where it is. Are you seriously missing your cue? <laughs> <laughs> yes. What? What happened? <laughs> what if he were wearing the knee-high Sphinx? Look at him. He's he's panning. He's panning to the audience. Stephen graduated from the zoo in 1916. <laughs> Just this old giraffe. It's true. I went back to my old cage. It was great. Oh, we're so glad you're free now. <laughs> no, he's not. We keep, no, we keep, now he's in this zoo. We keep him caged in the back. That's why it took a minute to open the cage, so he took a minute to get out here. They had to shoo him out. He yeah. was way in the corner, all like, oh, no, <laughs> not thank this you. again. Now, Stephen, you're a local. Yes, I'm from Southern California. <laughs> And I love San Diego. <laughs> that seems sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sweater, it's real. Okay. Yeah. Improved. We believe you. Yep. Any, Is, any last message for San Diego? Uh, stay, cl- stay sexy. Oh, you just. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Get your own fucking saying. He steals our motto right in front of us. And then we, and then we walk off. That's it. <laughs> well, he just ended the show. <laughs> <laughs> what if we were like that? I mean, we're going to be very soon. Yeah. Look at this. Huge shows of people come to see a podcast. This is nuts. It's nuts. It's so fucking crazy. You guys, what are you doing? You guys, thank you for making this our job. We yes. love it. Stupid. I used to do like work on with food stuff, and that's really cool because I love food. But then you have to write like a new recipe for fucking um, Super Bowl every year, and it was like, how, what are you supposed to do with fucking buffalo chicken? Like, what would there's you do? no other way to make it a thing. Let's hear some options right now. What um, would you do? Buffalo chicken dip, buffalo and chicken planters, buffalo and chicken fucking. Now let's change it up one. a little bit. It's impossible. Buffalo chicken pudding. <laughs> Karen, you should be at Buffalo putting Jello. Je- I don't know what it. Buffalo Put putting a wing jello. into a Jello mold, yep. and then hide it in someone's mailbox. It's a different. <laughs> my thing is a different thing. My point was, and then yesterday I was like, murder. I can't find a murder. Where's the murder? And I'm like, oh my god, my life is so much cooler now. <laughs> I was so happy that it was like I love food, but I've loved true crime, and I didn't realize it was going to be a job. And then I was like, oh my god. Yeah. Because then you see all the food bloggers who are like. Here's a new recipe for a Thanksgiving thing. Ugh. New thing to put stuffing in. Good luck. Stop it. Oh, hazelnuts? You blew my mind. <laughs> now that was a rant. When you you really went off on I it. I really did. I mean, here's the problem. We drove down from LA today. Normally, we have all kinds of travel anecdotes and funny, hilarious things of how the this city is different than our city, and we're just like, should we go back tonight or just stay? Like. <laughs> It's not, this is a little bit hometowny for yeah. us. We're just, yeah. This, this is a lot like, you know what I'm saying? It, it's like LA, but here's the thing people here don't give a shit. And that <laughs> rules. It rules. If you're in the industry, it's like in the chillest way possible. You're not like in the industry and yeah. like really care. You make movies about pot or whatever. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I and saw a guy that I, when we were driving through and it, from the head up, he looked like my friend's dad. And I was like, whoa. But then from the neck down, he was dressed like a 19 year old surfer. And I'm like, <laughs> that's not Christine's dad. <laughs> it's not. It can't be him. He wouldn't have changed that much maybe, this quickly. Maybe he went into the, um, what's it called when they, they hide you when you're in the cop? Witness protection, protection program. Witness protection program. There you go. Thank what you. What do you call it when they hide you? Oh, this is my favorite murder, by the way. Oh, That's yeah. Scary. Good one. Thank you. Good point. Yeah. That's a really good point. This is my favorite murder. Yeah. I wanted and to say so after I tripped over the words witness protection program. <laughs> 
so. We are highly qualified <laughs> true crime podcasters. Yeah. That's Georgia Hartstark. That's Karen Kilgarrett. Thank you. Thank you. We actually now like to say that to our audiences before we start, because we know that sometimes people bring... Uh, outsider, we'll call them outsiders yeah. to the show. Yeah, pony boys and soda pops yeah. and whatnot. They bring them to the show, <laughs> mm-hmm. and they sit here and they listen to us blather about fucking nothing. And then, like, I'll say pockets, and everyone starts screaming. And they're like, "What the fuck is going on?" And we feel bad for you, and we're sorry. Uh-huh. And we know the majority of you are men, and you're like, "What is happening to my spouse?" Yeah. This goes out to the Ashers too, by yeah. the way. Dudes. Yeah. Dudes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we just, um, just so you know, like, uh, we talk about true crime, which is very dark and horrifying, but then we also make jokes, which is highly inappropriate, mm-hmm. so. And we know. You don't need to let us know. We know. Yeah, we know. <laughs> my, if my mom's told me, then, it, then I know. It's in there. And I'm purposely doing otherwise just to piss her off. That's right. So, you because don't we're always 14. <laughs> That's true. Right? Yeah. Come on. Let's do it. Uh, anything to wrap up? Any other questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I guess that, that's all I got. You got those allergies going got again? Fucking, at least this time I brought a tissue and didn't have to blow my nose on my skirt or the tablecloth, which I've done before. I feel Both. like you have blown your nose on every surface of, the, of anything in this country. <laughs> it's some of the major theaters in yeah. this country. Just don't care anymore. Yeah. You know? It's a Do great feeling. you guys know a good allergist? Please let me know. <laughs> Email it. Email it. And thank you <laughs> for, in advance <laughs> for helping me. Do you the want... one allergist? Just yeah, that's right. I love reactive tissue. <laughs> It's not what allergists do. Do you want to show everybody your shoes real quick? Oh, sure. I mean, you rarely wear a high heel. I fucking hate high heels. And those look good. Thank you. They're only mildly painful. Thank you. They belong in the gaslight district, if anything does. They do. They really do. Can I do the thing? They're vintage. (laughs) (laughs) They are, and that's why they're more comfortable, is because someone wore them for years, and then I put them on my feet. It's disgusting. Some old Italian lady wore them for like 40 years. They were her church shoes. Yep. Yeah. And now I'm summertime. Letting it up in them. Yeah. But poor, ruining the memory of, what's her name? Oh, of, uh, you mean Giancarla? Yeah. Uh, Rossetti? Yes. Whoops. <laughs> that sounds right. So bad at improvising Italian women's names. <laughs> well, yeah, we've always said that about you. I know. I have to take that class at UCB. <laughs> Should we sit down? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Director's chairs. Director's chairs in San Diego. We're going to tell you guys what to do. Then a directing, directing. Is that how it works? I think so. And then you just like, and then you just pack it up and walk the fuck away. <laughs> That's the nice part. We get to keep these. Did you hear? <laughs> to go. You said so just now. Yep. Here. Okay. To go with the rug. Okay. Beverages. Did you guys just see me try to talk into this? I just tried to like, go like this. <laughs> Beverages are opened, and that's <laughs> that's how you know the show's starting. Is the waters are open, and I'm trying to talk into it. Right now, the sound guy's watching you hold a bottle of water that close to a mic, and he's like, "Don't oh, no, 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 no. kill her." <laughs> Fair enough. Consummate professionals. Professionals, <sighs> guys. Someday I'm going to get some tights that are the same color as my dress. (laughs) Or maybe ones you just don't notice. And then I won't bring all of George's hair with me on my dress (laughs) to show you. That's my dog, strangers. Oh, I thought you said George's hair. I'm so sorry. Because George's hair. This shit. Yeah. I like didn't know I was like losing all my hair like that <laughs> all over you. Oh yeah, clumps of it are coming out. I just didn't want to talk about what if it. I just didn't know. Yeah. And then you just said it, and I was like, oh, that's so funny. <laughs> Who goes first? It's me. Okay. Guys. Ready? Yeah. It's time. It's time to talk about all the things you're not supposed to talk about. <laughs> right. 
With America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh, you'll get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality. From step-by-step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in about 30 minutes. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and takeout. HelloFresh has you covered. There's something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie smart and vegetarian, and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and and Craft Burgers. HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other meal kit, so you'll know you're getting something incredible. HelloFresh is flexible, and it fits your lifestyle, easily change your delivery days, food preferences and skip a week whenever you need break out of your dinner rut and make deliciousness part of every week with hello fresh i love that even though hello fresh is super easy and they make it really basic and like straightforward you still feel like you're cooking this like incredible home cooked dinner and that makes me feel good about myself and that instead of just ordering takeout i'm actually making something and preparing something at home and that just it feels good so for 80 dollars off your first month of hello fresh go to hellofresh.com slash murder 80 and enter murder 80 it's like receiving eight meals for free only at hellofresh.com slash murder 80 promo code murder 80 Go by. And guess who I'm going to talk about? Betty Broderick. Yeah. I was so excited when uh, I put together, well, really, when Stephen sent me, Stephen sends us like lists of choices that we could have every city we go to. He's very thorough. Um, and each get different choices so we don't overlap. Mm-hmm. It's a wonderful system. And when I saw Betty Broderick's name on my list, I was like, oh, fuck yeah, I forgot she lived down there. I have seen every single fucking Forensic Files, 2020, Nightline, every single... I've seen this woman all my life. The Full, the full House episode she was yeah. in. <laughs> She's seen them all. I'm saying that because I don't know who she is off the top of my head, so when I find out, I'm going to be like, oh, I'm really bummed I made that the joke. The Bob Hope Young Comedian special where she <laughs> nailed that seven-minute set. I mean, she's just been in my life. No, you do know her, I bet. I'm sure, but I don't know names. Um, well, I'll just tell you about it. But uh, I got... <laughs> That'd be great. All of my... Most of my information from, of course, uh, Wikipedia. <laughs> God bless them. I use them daily. Won't give him a dime. <laughs> Just kidding. Donate. <laughs> That's what my father used to say when I would walk in and he would be watching PBS at night. And I'd be like, what are you watching? He'd be like, Nova for free. <laughs> I've ne- he'd, that was his big brag. I've never given him a dime. Oh, my God. <laughs> hilarious. We are, he's never listening to this episode. <laughs> he can't. We have to burn this the second that we're done. Uh-huh. Um, but I got some really good information from a podcast called Once Upon a Crime that you guys probably listen to, has, hosted by Esther Ludlow. Elizabeth Ann Broderick grew up in the New York City suburb of Eastchester. She was the third of six children born to a devout Roman, to devout Roman Catholic parents. Her mother was Irish American and her father was Italian American. That's a bad combination, by the way. I don't know if... Are there any Irish Italians here? Because they're all, it's not good. It's not, right? You're a lunatic, right? You're, they're screaming, super repressed, but then you also scream all the time, like nothing makes sense. <laughs> <clears throat> the Basiglias were very strict parents, um, uh, and as Betty later recalled, she was trained to act as a housewife since the day she was born. Mm. Uh, go to Catholic schools, be careful with dating until you find a Catholic man, support him while he works, be blessed in your later years with beautiful grandchildren. That was pass, the goal. hard pass. <laughs> no. What's my other option? <laughs> uh, I let, guess like snort cocaine in a small room until you die. Great. <laughs> yes. Yes, I picked that one. Okay. She graduates from East Chester High School in 1965, and that same year when she was 17, she traveled to Indiana with her friend to go watch Notre Dame. Really? We're in San Diego. Pretend you're from San Diego. (laughs) Play it cool. Just kidding. Go go Notre Dame. (laughs) Um, She goes to see a Notre Dame football game with her friend, and there she meets a man named Dan Broderick. He was born in Pittsburgh. He was the eldest son of a large Irish Catholic family. Oof. All Irish Catholic, you're done for. 
That's what I'm from. <laughs> Not good. Okay, he wasn't as tall or athletic as the boys that Betty was used to dating because she was gorgeous, you know, like... Uh, had her choice of men but he lavished her with attention mm. from the second that they met he doted on her mm. um, so uh, she graduates from the college of Mount St. Vincent in the Bronx uh, where she majored in early childhood education um, and she and Dan date and then on April 12th 1969 Dan, um, they are married uh, they honeymoon in the Caribbean, and very soon after they return from the honeymoon, she finds pregnant. out she's pregnant. That's right. <laughs> you guys. You Italians and you Irish. <laughs> Just get started right Oh, wait. Get those babies. Don't get to know each other at all. <laughs> That's exactly it. She's like, what's your favorite movie? It's <laughs> amazing. Um, so he was finishing up uh, his medical degree at Cornell and they're so poor that they have to move into the dorms together. This isn't, there's a reenactment um, uh, that I watched recently and it's uh, two actors playing the two of them. And I'm they sure it's great. Walk, it's amazing. It's such good acting. Um, and some really great backting also because they walk into this dorm room. Backting? Is that a thing? <laughs> it's my thing. I love it. Yeah. There's, you can really give a lot with your back mm. if you're a good backter. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go to backing class. You should. You should. Because that's how you become a great extra. Yeah, I've done that. Right? Is you just, you really let people know something's going on that way. I've definitely, there's definitely me walking away in the background in a camera in like TV shows and shit. For real? Just walking away, walking past and walking away. What do you mean? I was an extra. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. I thought something happened. Like I thought, <laughs> <laughs> when? When did you get this part? Well, it was on Full House. <laughs> Sorry, go on. That was irrelevant. Wait, was that a 90s thing that you did when you moved to LA, mm -hmm. like moved into the city? Clueless, the TV show. Yes. Dharma and Greg. <gasps> Dharma and Greg? Yeah. Did you, were you one of the people in their living room? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just in the corner. You know how I had someone in the corner hiding every episode? You guys didn't know that? It's like a I secret. was the girl hider in the living room. Yeah. And then some stupid shit, other stupid shit. Well, congratulations. Thank you. It was really a highlight of my life. I bet. Did you get to, did you get to wait for like 18 hours? 18 hours. Yeah. Eat hard-boiled eggs and... It Backed it up. Right. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Uh, goodbye. Oh, and Joan of Arcadia. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, deep cut. Yeah. Who was Joan of Arcadia? It was... Oh. You mean the actress? No, the storyline. Like, don't... just tell me the uh, whole series arc really quick. <laughs> I was on it. I didn't watch it. You didn't write it? I didn't write it. I don't understand how any of it works. Okay. In this reenactment, okay. Betty and Dan walk in and they have to move into a legit dorm room with ma a married couple and she's pregnant. It's the saddest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> like one of those dorm rooms with the cement blocks as walls oh. where you can't like put up your poster unless you get that special gum adhesive. Mm -hmm. Like dark, dark times for Dan and Betty. Mm -hmm. So um, their daughter Kim is born in 1970 and a second daughter Lee is born the, the next year. Guys. Irish twins. Um, Dan finishes medical school and then tells Betty he's decided that no. he's... What? Now, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean stop, go. <laughs> you meant like, you don't like where no. this is headed? Yeah. Dan's now going to get his law degree. Oh, okay. Because he's decided that he's going to be a medical malpractice lawyer. All that right. that's where the money's at. Um, which he, he was all about. And so uh, he had to get a student loan. He goes to Harvard Law. Um, and Betty starts working. She's two kids and working so that he can go through law school. Honey. Um, after four years, uh, he graduates and he's hired by, by a very high status law firm here in San Diego. So the whole, he moves the whole family to Coral Reef. Nobody? No, nothing. Did I cut and paste that wrong? <laughs> Or did he literally move them onto a coral reef? <laughs> and that's nothing that... I feel like a lot of these, the places where bad things happen, they change the name of the, <laughs> the place immediately to just to be like, you can't find it, They're like, you weirdo tourist. Oh, that used to be called Knife Town, but we had to change the name. <laughs> bad things yeah. happen. All right. But now... 
he's got this high status job, so she she doesn't have to work anymore. Right. So she gets to be uh, the housewife that she's always been told that she has to be. <laughs> um, so Dan. Um, at the more successful he becomes at this law firm, and he's very successful, the longer and longer his hours become. Mm-hmm. And uh, because he's, you know, he tells Betty he's out whining and dining clients and working really hard. Well, she, of course, is getting pissed. And, um, you know, she makes dinners and he, he misses them. And she kind of starts ranting to the kids, talking about their father, and he's not here. And, you know, like, really, she's she always had this habit of kind of when she got mad, she didn't care what she said in front of the kids. That is a ticket to therapy. <laughs> Those kids. Romance Town 100. <laughs> um, but she's feeling intensely unappreciated. She's caring for two small children. She's in this house by herself. You know, there's no adults around. She doesn't like the family dynamic, essentially. So at one point, she convinces, or they go to, I shouldn't say she convinced him, they went to Marriage Encounter, oh. which was this Catholic marriage retreat in the 70s or mid, early 80s. Encounter? Marriage encounter. My parents, not only did my parents go, no. my parents went and they had a sticker on the back of my dad's Volkswagen. <laughs> marriage encounter. As if like, we're good. We're doing it with the Lord's help. Oh my God. Yeah. Big time. It just sounds like a swingers retreat for no. people who believe in UFOs. How dare you? <laughs> Doesn't it? Marriage encounter? Like, whenever I'm, I, like, you want to have an encounter with your fucking partner. You don't want to have, like, a, <laughs> just be something like, <laughs> for people who believe in UFOs. <laughs> Marriage encounter. Yeah. Swinging with aliens. That's right. It's marriage encounter. Yeah. <laughs> An encounter is just like the least romantic marriage word. Yeah. I don't get it. It's, I, um, I'm going to change that name. Marriage passing experience. <laughs> yeah. What they did at Marriage Encounter was you'd have to write your uh, spouse a long letter talking about how you felt about the marriage. Ugh. And when I was like... <laughs> bar. When I was like eight, I found my parents' <gasps> letters. No! Karen. I love little Karen. She's such a bad girl. Little Karen... Little Karen didn't, wasn't good with boundaries. <laughs> but little Karen didn't raise herself. Someone, no. I actually didn't read, I started to read them. Oh. And it started with my mom's. And it was like, dear Jim, you're this and you're that. And then I was like, ew, this is none of my business. <laughs> good for you. You are good with boundaries, though. Was, you were like, here it is. <laughs> I'm creeped out by love. <laughs> um... I mean, they were they were married for like forty five years. So marriage encounter works. Sign Apparently. up today. Yeah, my parents didn't go. Divorced quickly. <laughs> <laughs> One so. of them fast divorces. Yeah. Okay. In Dan's letter, he talks about how he knows he's a workaholic and he knows he's not being a good husband or a good father, but he has these financial goals that he really wants to reach. And Betty's letter is all about being alone in the marriage. Um, it must have been an okay experience for them because after, soon after they had their third, uh, uh, third child, a boy named Dan. Um, so at this point, Betty has two preschoolers and an infant at home. Um, and she started to feel like she's losing her identity. Um, meanwhile, Dan is so successful and doing so well, um, he actually became slightly locally famous because he represented one of the families of the victims of uh, Brent Spencer, the I Don't Like Monday school shooter. Oh, so he Brenda, was, yeah. he became well, kind of well known. Wow. Um, uh, so by the fall of 1991, he's doing so well, he leaves his original law firm and opens his own. And he gets this big, fa- these big fancy offices in a high rise, and he asks Betty to redecorate the offices. And she comes in and she kills it. It's gorgeous. Everyone is like amazed, and it's all very high status and like. 70s. She- I bet it's so 70s. Oh my god, the brass and the chrome. <laughs> The smoked glass. Mm-hmm. Can you see it? Ferns <laughs> everywhere. Ferns. She's like, we'll have a, a, a fern garden over here. Mm-hmm. Macrame everywhere. And armpit hair over here. <laughs> uh, oh, no, sorry. This is 81. Rainbows. Neon rainbows. Mm. And a nagel in the entryway. Um, okay. So... Dan buys a two-seater Jaguar. And Betty loses her fucking oh, shit. hell yeah. Right? 
it's his dream car, but she's like, you clearly have no interest in being part of this family. <laughs> Although to be fair, back in the 80s, they were like, throw him in the trunk or like put them all in the front seat together. That's true. <laughs> like, don't worry about seatbelts. Grab that roof. Yeah. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, Betty drove a Suburban and her personalized license plate read, load them up. So she was oh. like... Yeah, she was doing that mother thing. My God, sexism exists. I mean, or it did in the 80s, I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't anymore. But she was like, she was playing the part and they were super rich. Like she bought, they bought stuff. She had a spending problem, they said. And she bought shit all the time. The kids had everything they could possibly want. She bought designer clothes. She was like super into the way she looked. But she was getting really neurotic because she was starting to gain weight and she was getting older and she was starting to gain weight and she felt like she was losing her looks and so she was starting to get like um compulsive kind of reaction i'm not uh analyzing her i don't i don't know her but um <laughs> but but she does sound a lot like when i read through the story i was like did she take diet pills because oh, she acts yeah. a lot like me when i was on diet pills <laughs> It's like when you start yelling at somebody and then you just kind of can't stop yelling or you're in your mind, you're like, I don't feel this way anymore. And yet my mouth is still angry. I don't know what to do. Um, it's a theory. It's not a fact. So, okay. So the, the fights are beginning to escalate. So when Dan would come home late from work, she'd lock him out of the house. He'd have to throw rocks at the kids' windows so they could let him in. And then if they did that, Betty would yell at the kids. Uh. That, that was the worst part. These kids were right in the middle of this awful marriage and they were they got screamed at constantly by Betty by Betty being angry at Dan she would scream at them because they were the only ones there she would scream about how awful he was and she started cursing and like getting really foul mouthed which I don't have a problem with but it's not cool around <laughs> five year olds um, it works for me <laughs> did Janet have a mouth on her? oh fuck yeah and then she'd be like do as I say not as I do don't curse do as I say, not as I do, as we're fucking jam. <laughs> For everything. Saying. <laughs> as she took a big drag of a joint. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, here's this fucked up thing. She would, when Dan wouldn't come home from work, she would sit the kids down and tell them they were getting divorced. And then all the kids would get super upset. What? And then she'd go, now, since we're getting divorced, which parent do you <gasps> want to live with? And they, it would be super upsetting. And then they, it wasn't until Dan would come home from work that he would be like, no, we're not getting divorced. Every, it's everyone, everything's fine. Right. So it was that, um, in, in this story, I always had that thing of like, you know, this story has been in, in kind of like, in, society in our minds i guess for since the 80s since it happened mm -hmm. because at first it was like the fucking crazy wife you know goes yeah. crazy and then there was the second wave of or was she driven crazy yeah and you, there's lots of ways to take it but when i hear stories like that it's just like wh whatever's happening that is not fair and that control yourself figure out a way to control yourself because you are that's abuse you're abusing four children yeah. repeatedly yeah um so uh, and the and the other problem was that when they would fight, he would just ignore her. Which, oh. as I was typing it, I was getting furious because it was like, <laughs> it, like her. She already had an anger problem, and yeah. he would just pretend like nothing was happening <gasps> and like sit down and eat dinner. <gasps> Dan, but he's Irish Catholic, and that's how we do it. <laughs> Shut it down inside. <laughs> um, so then it. In the fall of 1983, he hires a woman named Linda uh, Kolkenna to be his legal assistant. Linda, before that, had been a Delta Airlines flight attendant and had no legal training. Bet she's hot. She was a, she was a very homely girl with <laughs> large glasses right. and large spanks. <laughs> no, that's not true at all. In fact, Betty overheard Dan describing her... Uh, Linda as being beautiful at a Christmas party and lost her fucking shit of course right. and immediately became convinced that the two of them were having an affair and she would harangue Dan about it all the time and ask him about it and he was like you're crazy you're crazy you're crazy gas lamping her um, yes right you Probably know how it is in the gaslight district <laughs> he would take her to the gaslight district and gas lamp the fuck out of her yeah. um it, that November, um, 
she threw, they had their, both of their birthdays were in November. So she threw a dinner party and threw the, had this big party, made this huge gourmet meal. He didn't fucking show up for it. What a dick. And that night she, it, it, you know, attempted suicide, very, very light cuts on her wrists that when he came home, he bandaged them and put her to oh, bed and man. took care of her. Um, but she was in, clearly in a very, very bad place. So she started hinting around at Christmas time. She starts hinting around that she wants an em- this emerald ring for Christmas. Um, and on Christmas Day, when she, he hands her the velvet jewelry box and she opens it up it isn't the one she wanted it's smaller and less expensive and she throws a fucking tantrum and like shuts Christmas down uh huh so priorities you know what I mean like (laughs) you fight for what you need emotionally I mean maybe it was ugly we don't know I mean it's an emerald what the fuck do you want yeah what are you in fucking Wizard of Oz what are you gonna what are you gonna go to the Emerald City and fucking get your hair curled like Dorothy? <laughs> Who Calm are we? down. <laughs> so, and uh, this whole time, the, these fights are escalating. Um, uh, he he actually moved out after uh, after that. He packed his bags after she ruined Christmas. Moved out after two weeks. She was like, the children can't be are inconsolable, and so he moved back. Well, that's healthy for them. Yeah, it's healthy for all of them. Yeah. Um, uh, so let's see. This is a very odd point. The, the, the straw that broke the camel's back for Dan was during one of these horrible fights, Betty threw a bottle of gel at him. Like hair gel? Hair gel. Yeah. Was he really into his hair gel? I mean, it was 1985. Everybody was really yeah. into hair gel. Okay. You didn't, it was a, actually a city mandate that you had to wear a shit ton of hair gel. Remember that, like, what was it, like Malibu something, and it looked like jello when you just, yeah, in through your hair? Yeah. LA mm-hmm. Looks. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's one brand. <laughs> it was what I was thinking of, to be fair. <laughs> that shit smelled like. Um, bad chemicals. Like paste and chemicals. Like chemicals, like they didn't even put anything, fl- a flowery smell in it. They were like, what if we kind of sent this like gasoline and then the kids can put it in their hair? <laughs> that would be fun. Everything was flammable back <laughs> then. Why is my hair falling out again? <laughs> okay, so look, listen. Look at my Dan moves out. It's February 1985. He buys a house, uh, his own house. Betty becomes increasingly unhinged and she one night Kim the oldest daughter comes home she's in high school and they she and Betty get into a fight because she came home late she drives Kim over to um, Dan's house and leaves her on the front porch and drives away doesn't check if Dan's home he wasn't home he was working late and so by the time Dan did get home it was like 11 o'clock at night and she's just sitting on the porch crying Mm. so she starts living with Dan well then um, a little while later uh Kim and Dan are out to having pizza for dinner one night, and when they come home, um, their younger brother, I think it was eight-year-old Dan, was sitting on the porch oh, crying. Hey, hey. She had left him on the porch, and nobody was home, and he was eight years old. Fuck. Um, so eventually, Dan got the custody of all four kids. Um, it, she basically went and dropped all of them off and was like, "This, you deal with it for a while. Uh. Which, listen, for a woman that has raised four children entirely herself... You go, okay. Sure I mean, custody. That's not awful. Yeah. yeah. Sure custody. Or do fucking something, Dan. Um, Dan drives away in his Jag. Sorry, I can't hear you. Um, okay. Basically, their divorce was so acrimonious and horrible, it became famous. Um, they got divorced. It was finalized in 1989, uh, one of the more famous divorce cases in the United States. Um, and part of it was because part of uh, one of the arguments was involving the fact that women who worked and put their husband through school, um, how that would affect uh, the alimony and, you yeah. know, and the outcome of the divorce ruling. They get it all. I mean, yeah. you'd like to think. Wouldn't you? Um, Betty starts leaving incredibly profane answering machine messages. Uh, I, didn't, I don't know if starts, but I mean, she, it, she was 
she was trying to com- like kind of contact him and make him understand mm-hmm. how fucking livid she was all the time and she couldn't do it so they have hours and hours of her answering machine messages and it's fucking nuts I want to listen it's not good um she, she, there were restraining orders. She would break into that house and like go through his shit and try to find stuff. Finally, he admitted that he, in fact, all along had been having an affair with Linda since 1983. Not, no one here shocked. I mean, yeah, not good. Um, one time she went into the house, the kids were there. So she would go to Dan's house. The kids, I think at that point, both girls lived there and the boys would live there sometimes. Mm-hmm. She walked in and said, there was a pie on the counter. And uh, she said, oh, what's that? And one of the boys, the younger boys not thinking was like, oh, Linda made that for dad. It's his favorite Boston oh. cream pie. And she picked up the pie and went upstairs and she went into the bedroom and like just started scooping out the, the middle of the pie and throwing it on the walls, smearing it on the rad, bed, though. smearing it on his clothes. <laughs> I kind of love that, though. <laughs> I mean, you can do it. You can do it. Yeah. But was, she, was she wrong? Does it uh, Maybe. ultimately? Yes. It's better than guns, <laughs> but it's not good. Um, okay, so they get. Uh, they on April twenty second, nineteen eighty nine, Dan and Linda get married, mm. and I think. Oh, sorry, Stephen. Shit. We've got several pictures that we need to show you. Hold on. <clears throat> so, can you show a, a, an early picture? Because that's Linda and that's Dan. No photos oh, of sorry. our butts, by was the, the way. The first one was um, Betty and Dan at their wedding. Okay. This is Linda and Dan. Oh, she's pretty. He's 42 and she's 28. Ooh. Linda looked basically like uh, Betty looked when she was that age. So it, her whole obsession was she'd basically just been replaced. She went in, she did all the work, she put him through two fucking schools, she had his kids, she raised his kids, and then she got replaced. Um, <clears throat> all right, so, oh, the day they got married, a family friend stayed with Betty to make sure that she didn't go and wreck the wedding. Ugh, That's how extreme uh, her behavior was. Yeah. So... Seven months after they were married, Betty Broderick drove to Dan's house at 1041 Cypress Avenue in the Marston Hills neighborhood of San Diego and using her daughter Lee's key to enter the house while the couple was asleep, she shot and killed them execution (gasps) style. Both of them? Yes. Oh my, I think I remember this now. Yeah, right? You do because, do you have her arrest photo, Stephen? Whoa. That is one smug motherfucker right there. She was not bummed. There's Barry again. Oh my God, Barry! Barry's back. Barry is the Zelig of San Diego. Oh my God. She is most certainly not bummed. Wow, that's scary. That's so scary. I think my mom had that shirt. (laughs) I swear to God. I think my mom had that haircut. (laughs) Um... <clears throat> oh my god, that's so sad. Yeah, she she did that, and then she basically um, called her daughters and told them that she did it, and then and then turned herself into the police. Wow, um, that is awful. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's horrifying, and she did it uh, two days before her forty second birthday. Um, Okay, so two bullets uh, hit Linda in the head and chest, killing her instantly. One bullet hit Dan in the chest, um, and it looked like he was reaching for the phone. She had taken the phone and answering machine out of the room previously when she'd broken into the house. So that like, that came up later because it was entirely premeditated. Yeah, she said that she went over there. She didn't go over there to kill them. She just she just went over there to talk. I think is with what a she gun. Said. It's, yeah, instead of her mouth. Gun chats. Yeah, you know. Um, Meanwhile, she was getting $16,000 a month alimony. I know, right? She was living in a, at the time, $650,000 La Jolla beachfront property. Holy shit. She had shit. two cars, and she had a live-in, like, or not live-in, a, like a full-time boyfriend. A <laughs> full-time boyfriend. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Karen's in love. <laughs> Time boyfriend. <laughs> Thank you. 
I, <laughs> well, she doesn't want no part-time lover. That's right. Call Megan Trainer. I've got a hit for her. Um, <laughs> but this is so fucked up. Sorry. So, <laughs> sorry. This is the part where the stranger gets very upset. Yeah. Just so you know. Yeah. He gets shot. He reaches for the phone. There's no phone there. He doesn't die instantly. <gasps> and in fact, he said he looked at Betty and said to her, "Okay, you shot me. I'm dead." Oh. Those were his last words. The pretty fucking dark. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so basically, okay, now I just skip to the page. <laughs> Look at that insanity. Okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> she pleads not guilty to cu- two counts of murder. Uh huh. Um, and Does she know f- what that means. <laughs> Well, at her first trial, so the first trial starts in uh, October 22nd of 1990, and it was, all, of course, all over the media. Um, it was on uh, broadcast live on local television, uh, which, I, God, I would have loved to watch that. Could you imagine, mm-hmm. like, staying home from school mm-hmm. and just, like... Nine years old, and I'm like, Mom, I'm not going to school! <laughs> I feel sick. Yeah. Hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> oh, shit. So, at, at that... Um, she testifies she didn't intend to kill her husband. She said she went to their house planning to kill herself. That's what it was. Oh. She went there saying she was going to kill herself in front of them. And then when she went in, she has no memory of what happened after that. Um, uh, and she says that he harassed her during the bitter divorce, left her emotionally and financially ruined. You know, financially ruined with your fucking thousands and thousands of dollars of uh, alimony. Her first trial end uh, in a deadlock jury. What? Yeah. Um, ten jurors um, reached the verdict of murder to hold out for manslaughter. Guys. Do yeah. they know what that means? Well, I think maybe some of them were like, oh, I put my husband through college as well. <laughs> and that motherfucker lives in <laughs> yeah. West Covina now with someone named Danielle. Um, <laughs> they call her Danny. <laughs> it's uh, not cool. Not cool. I think she roller skates for a living. Anyway, I'm really <laughs> angry. Um... So, when she's waiting her second trial, she's involved in a jailhouse scuffle with sheriff's deputies. I don't know. They started it. Uh, they allege that she uh, injured three of them and smeared feces around her jail cell. <gasps> Ew. So, I mean... I think she just kind of went full crazo, like, in jail. She was just like, I, I, you know what? I gotta be me. Goodbye. I'm just gonna do this yeah. thing. Later days, Later days. I don't have to carpool or do anything. What will I do with my time? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so her second trial begins October 15th, 1991. The prosecution argues for a finding of first-degree murder, uh, saying that she carried out a cold-blooded execution. Um, and the defense, again, says it should be voluntary manslaughter because she was driven to the slaying by years of psychological abuse and intimidation. But under the cross-examination, she just... Oh, so she says that when she goes into the house on this trial, that she walked in and went into an altered state of consciousness um, and doesn't remember pulling the trigger. Um, so they play back and those answering machine messages Ugh. where she's fucking going crazy um and she, at one point she actually talks about getting her son to go beat up her husband <gasps> his father um in uh, december 5th 1991 superior court judge uh thomas j whelan instructs the jury to consider options of involuntary manslaughter voluntary manslaughter and second and first degree murders the jurors deliberate and they come back to find Betty Broderick guilty of two counts of second-degree murder plus two counts of using a firearm in the commission of a felony. Um, she just recently was up for a parole. No way. Uh-huh. And um, it was the sec- it's the second time she's been up for parole. And on that podcast that I mentioned, um, they play a tape of the four kids, <gasps> and two of them want her to stay in jail, and two of them oh, want her to get out. Man. And it is... It ultimately, the, the whole thing is heartbreaking. There's kind of, there, it's bad. There's nothing worse than that. 
but because these children, whatever was going on between those adults, these children had no control and nothing to do with it, and their lives got so fucked up because of yeah. it, obviously. I mean, they ended up doing fine, but the idea of that, that they're, they're still in the middle of this, totally. and they're still stuck in the middle of, of that, that horrible life, it's so shitty. To end on a nice note, um, <laughs> Uh, I believe it was in 1992, they made a, a made-for-TV movie that Meredith ba Baxter Bernie starred in and was nominated for an Emmy. Ah. So let's focus on the positive. That was Brady <laughs> Broderick, everybody. Wow. <clears throat> Sorry. No. <laughs> My papers. So, okay, um, this isn't a murder because I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. No. Uh, instead, I'm doing the cult I most likely would have joined, <gasps> Heaven's Gate. Yes! <laughs> yes! Yes! This is the exact same story of when Steven sent it to me. I was like, murdered girl, murdered girl, this girl got murdered. Heaven's Gate! And I was like, oh my God! <laughs> Steven, I'm so angry at you that you didn't send me Heaven's Gate that we're going to have a long talk after this show. <laughs> after this one and before the next one. He, gave, he did me a solid. It's so good. I you can't wait. I mean? Listen. Wait, maybe I, maybe I won't yell at him because it's going to be fun to not have had to do the work. Listen, they had a lot of beliefs and I had like <laughs> six pages of their beliefs. Oh, and yeah. And I was like crossing shit out. You know what I mean? It was like, all right. Any offhand that you can remember like... Just besides um, Nikes and j j Jello shots. Well, they did this thing where they they you know did the whole, gave up all the Jello shots. <laughs> Why don't I listen more? That was so funny. <laughs> well, I want to join that cult. You're trying to do your thing. All right, I'll I'll tell you all okay, about okay. it. Okay. You know what? Let me tell you about it. Okay. Actually. Okay. All right. Marshall Applewhite. He's the son of a Presbyterian minister. So already got it together he uh he begins his foray mm -hmm. copied and pasted that no that's a um you did it in the early 70s into biblical prophecy he was fired from the university of saint thomas in houston texas because of an alleged homosexual relationship with one of his students so that's wrong like, <laughs> which part all of it <laughs> oh you guys didn't know <laughs> Um, what we're like? Okay, so in so he goes at some point he goes into a psychiatric institution. Maybe it's after this, and in March 1972, and he meets Bonnie Nettles. She's a 44 year old married nurse, music teacher from Texas. She's super into theosophy and Theosophy. Yeah, we know theosophy. Did I copy and paste that wrong, too? It's, no, it's theology and philosophy mixed right. together. We know what it is. It's kind of like, uh, where did my, okay. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. Okay, uh, laugh at me. It's fine. Um, biblical prophecy, all that shit. She's super into it. And um, they, uh, so they kind of become really, they become really close friends pretty immediately when he gets out of the hospital. They go on a, uh, six, long, six months long road trip across the United States. They start calling themselves Bo and Peep. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so like, at, inside this Jesus. mental hospital, this nurse is going around like handing out little cups of pills, but she's like, I don't know, there's something about you. I just want to, yeah. I think we should be really good friends. The Th thing about you is that your face is always in a Bible, <laughs> and you're super into the possibility that extraterrestrials ah. exist. Oh, almost a marriage encounter situation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I like it. I yeah. like it. It was on my mind. Yeah. So he, he said he later recalled that he felt like he had known her for a long time and that he thought they had met in a past life. And um, she told him that their meeting had been foretold by extraterrestrials and persuaded him that he had a, a divine assignment. She was the nurse at the mental hospital? <laughs> That's what she said. She was behind the counter. Maybe she was lying. <laughs> and we don't know. All right. Um, so by June of 1974, they study religious stuff. They're into religion, sci-fi, theology, 
and they conclude uh, that they had been chosen to fill the biblical prophecies and they had been given higher level minds than other people. I want a relationship like that where you're like, you meet a person, you guys are sitting in Applebee's. I mean, we would be sitting in Applebee's and you're just like, this isn't just normal chemistry. This is alien shit happening between us. <laughs> well, that's every fucking couple in the beginning. They're so annoying because like we're meant to be and we're supposed to be and like this is fate. And it's like you just met at a party. And, like, <laughs> you like the other one's smell, yeah. pheromones, and you just don't understand it. You're, she looks like your third grade teacher, <laughs> and he is taller than you, so it's all working out. <laughs> That's love, baby. That's love. Right. Or maybe you're aliens. Or maybe you're I, both Bible prophecy aliens. We don't know for we sure. We shouldn't judge. Listen. Look. Um, da, 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 da. They wrote a pamphlet that described Jesus' reincarnation as a Texan. <laughs> Sound familiar, Texas? That's where Marshall Applewhite was from. Maybe it's him. Oh, or it could be a quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Who knows? You got a team right. The Cowboys. I, I did. What was the other one? I think I called the... Denver. Um, the Denver Rattlesnakes. <laughs> they didn't like it. It's not a thing. They didn't like it when I called their team a rattlesnake. <laughs> oh, well. What um, happens? We know. We don't care. <laughs> They said they were two witnesses described in the N period, I wrote, and called themselves the UFO 2. Oh my God, they have the worst Shut fucking names up. for themselves. Get out of Get here, Bo and that? Peep. You already have a name. Already, I have a better one. The 2FO. Come on, the 2FOs. How about the... <laughs> well, that, that is off good. the top of my head. No, she's good. But also, how about this lifelong rule? Don't give yourself nicknames. It doesn't work no. that way. And if you're gonna, extra two restrials. Like, come <laughs> on. It's so easy. Get creative. Two uh, live crew of aliens. I just want to be a part of it. <laughs> That's good. That's I mean, good. I mean, um, so they thought they would be killed and then restored to life and transported onto a spaceship in an event called the demonstration. The marriage demonstration. <laughs> Aside from giving up their <laughs> earthly possessions, which is like what every cult does, um, which we're like, we know, they had a, a instituted a strict no sex, no human level relationship, no socializing rule without anyone outside of the cult. They didn't call themselves a cult, I bet. But right. I'm calling them that. <laughs> um, Sorry, so... So there's people in their cult now. And they also don't... It's, they're not boyfriend and girlfriend. No. because he He's not them. her full-time boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that with them. Well, he, I don't, they don't really say, but he had the homosexual relationship, so I think maybe he oh, was gay. And that's then they, not his jam. Maybe not. But mm-hmm. they don't talk about that. Okay. So, um, But I want to talk about it. <laughs> you know what? Let's make some shit up. How about? Let's call him on the phone. Oh. <laughs> um, Sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Don't be. Sorry. Uh, wait, you know how this ends then. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. It's not good. Okay. The, these kinds of decisions, it sounds like he wasn't like a, a dick um, cult leader. He was kind of like, you oh. want to be here and I'm not like going to make you. you He's a chill cult leader. He's like a cool, chill cult, le- cult leader. It's about UFOs, which sounds fucking fun. And I can't promise I wouldn't have joined this cult <laughs> just to see what they were like or maybe gone to a meeting. I mean, <laughs> sounds pretty cool. You like to check stuff yeah, out. If I believe in anything in this fucking life, it's aliens. So, For real? Like, yeah. Oh, I hate aliens. I know. I don't think we've ever seen. You know what? I'm not going there. Okay. Um, but a couple of their things I was like, yeah, yeah, that's what I've thought late at night when I can't sleep. No. Definitely. Like, where do giraffes come from? They're aliens. No, it just happened not. a long time ago. No, it's just evolution. It happens. <laughs> the the bear, small berries top of tall trees, you get a long neck. It's not aliens. Yeah, but they were... I totally agree. <laughs> now we're fighting about evolution. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree. I disagree. <laughs> Anyways, okay, so uh, so these decisions like this were always left up to the members, and eight of them, including um, including Marshall, decided to voluntarily get castrated because they were like, no sex, seriously. It's quite a commitment. <laughs> Tis. It's like a tattoo. Can You're going to have it forever. I'm going to ask a question and reveal a deep ignorance of mine. Okay. No, it's not getting your dick cut off. Okay. 
<laughs> if I had been wrong, I would have sounded so disgusting. No, I've always, every time I hear it, I just think someone gets no. kendalled. It's a little, it's just a little. That's not it. It's a little snip. It's just a little Lots snip of a vasectomy. Wait. No. It's the balls go, right? I think it's like a cat, right? When you like neuter Sir, a cat. Sir, you there. <laughs> Do you know? Dick? It's balls. It's balls. It's balls, everybody. Thank you. Sorry. You are so cool about that. Sorry. Cool as a fucking cucumber, this guy. <laughs> Sorry to bring cucumbers into this conversation. <laughs> He's like, not an I hate up. podcasts now. <laughs> He's like, my wife. I'm really worried about her. <laughs> um, ba, 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 castrated. <laughs> Where did I ended on castrated? Yep. Okay, here's where I would have quit the cult. Oh. They were also really into the master cleanse. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> they drink nothing, but you, we've all fucking done it. Yeah, I'm gonna do the master cleanse this week. Lemonade, cayenne pepper, and maple syrup. And we're all like, I'm drinking it. I did it for one day. Yeah. Not even. I did it from morning until my friend was like, hey, do you want to go to happy hour? And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Literally ate cheeseburgers and beer that night. I was like, I'll do this again. How'd that time. work out the next day? <laughs> I mean, my body at that point was a mess. So, oh. was like, thank you. Because that thing is, I think I did it the whole thing. Did you? I love a good starve. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a starver binger. That's my jam. I just want to keep on losing and gaining the same 40 pounds for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm good at it. Oh. I think I, I, I have talent. all the sizes of clothes. I'm comfortable in every fucking pair of pants I have. <laughs> Thoughts, feelings. I just, the, how do you do full time master cleanse? That's like you, oh, so they just always had diarrhea. I think broth. Oh, I think you got, the answer is always broth. Isn't oh, okay. It? All right. All right. All right. It doesn't matter. Listen, call them. I don't <laughs> Look. <know. laughs> Look and listen and call them. Um, throughout the late 70s and 80s, membership grew. They are described, the people who joined it were, quote, longtime truth seekers or spiritual hippies who had long since be believed in attempting to, quote, find themselves through spiritual means combing faiths in a sort of cultural milieu. Is that mm -hmm. how you say that? Yeah, that's how you say it. Well into the mid-80s. So essentially, they were people who should, like, now would have just gone to Burning Man. And like... <laughs> But back then, they had nothing. You know what I mean? Do you know how many castrations Burning Man is making sure don't happen yeah. every year? It's magical. Yeah. Thank God. It's beautiful. Okay, so then, and this is just like a little aside in the story, but I want more info. Fucking so Bonnie Nettles then dies, and I had, she dies in 1985, and I had to like find three different articles to find out how she died. She had cancer. Like, they oh. don't fucking mention it again. Oh. It's crazy. Or so even how like, he felt about it. Secondary death. Like, ooh, is yeah. this, is this suspicious. No, it's not. I just like want more information about her. Oh. You know what I mean? Sure. I just think she's a bigger part of this. Okay. She established this goddamn I mean, cult. I mean, she told him he was an alien or whatever. Beep. <laughs> Bo and beep. Beep. <laughs> beep. Beep. Uh, uh, by the mid 90s at this point they become super reclusive they start calling themselves the higher source and begin recruiting via uploaded internet content so the fucking internet starts and you know it's one of those like fucking GeoCities yeah. pages <laughs> do we have that Stephen? <laughs> yeah oh no yeah who designed that? fucking they did <laughs> Heaven's Gate did. Someone, that looks like a bad Super Bowl trophy, doesn't it? Kind of. Yeah. Oh, good. Black background with green writing. <laughs> and there's, you know, there's the space theme again. They're sure. sharing that over into the website. Yeah. So, uh, okay. I'll read that later. So uploaded internet then they begin to talk about the upcoming so this is when the hail bop comet was going to come down which if you guys are our age you'll know it was a big fucking crazy exciting deal sure right yeah um uh, some people thought the world was going to end oh for sure mm -hmm. uh they thought it housed the secret to the ultimate salvation and descendants into the kingdom of heaven aka the closure of heaven's gate so uh, um oh they <laughs> sorry <laughs> Don't fucking lead my story. <laughs> Can we show the closure of Heaven's Gate? 
<laughs> Go to the Show street. me a closure of Heaven's Gate. <laughs> Ding. Okay, so they upload videos onto the webpage, the beautiful webpage, and it gained a mass following through the internet. And then in 96, they move into a large home they called the Monastery. It was a 9,000 square foot residence in a gated community of upscale homes in uh, Rancho Santa Fe, San Diego. Ooh. I thought they changed the name because they were like, just, they did and they knocked the fucking house down later. But well, let me tell you why first. That's for the best. I right. Think. Okay. I like that everybody in the balcony is from Rancho Santa Fe. <laughs> <laughs> I also like that the front row for the first time was super helpful and awesome. Yeah, and yeah. Like, no, they're good people. Not just screaming. Don't, don't fucking, don't overdo it. Yeah, don't, um, don't ruin it. <laughs> okay. Okay, you're ruining it. Okay. Uh, at this point, Heaven's Gate, they believed Earth was about to be recycled. Their only chance to survive was to leave it immediately. And they were against suicide, but they defined suicide in their own content to mean to turn against the next level when it's offered. Um, and they thought human bodies were only vessels. Which, I mean, are they wrong? And uh, so in 96, they purchased Alien Abduction Insurance, which is a fucking thing. Who started that company? I don't know, but he's a genius. That's She's Ge- a genius. That's Geico right that's there. Fucking Ge- it's now Geico. Yep. Um, they changed their name to Geico. <laughs> it would cover up to 50 members and would pay out $1 million per person. It, it covered abduction, impregnation, or Ooh. death by aliens. Oh. Prove it. That's all I want to say. <laughs> Prove I'm not, I'm not impregnated by an alien. You don't know. <laughs> you can't tell. You can't tell. Um, okay. So on March 19th and 20th, 97, Marshall Applewhite taped himself speaking of mass suicide and asserted it was the only way to evacuate this earth. Do you remember the video? Oh, yeah. I think we have a photo of him in the video. The eyes, the eyes, the eyes, the eyes. (laughs) What's wrong? What's wrong, guys? It's chill. It's not... If you're ever in Starbucks and that guy's behind you, like... (laughs) Or taking your order. If anyone's eyes, if their lids go out past the iris so they're showing white on top, get the fuck out of there. Danger. As someone who has worked at both a health food grocery store and Starbucks, (laughs) these dudes, A, pay in dirty change. (laughs) And they also, when I worked at the health food store, they wouldn't let you scan their groceries because they thought that they were going to get poisoned by the government and so you had to bleep you pop every fucking number in the barcode in and like if you put it near the scanner they'd freak the fuck out (laughs) it's like it was it's real fun they're the only ones whose brains haven't been taken over by the government Uh, yeah they're the only normal ones because they're not okay god bless them please uh, please keep my Brussels sprouts away from that right light (laughs) ma'am and then the worst, they're not nice is the thing. I wouldn't, ca- I don't care. Do whatever you want, but be nice. Like, they were dicks about it. That's the thing about hippies is there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of bad press about them. Like, oh, they're so peas in love. Hippies are fucking rude. Yeah. They're rude. Yeah. They're selfish. Yeah. <laughs> Take that to the bank. Okay. All right. Okay. Taped himself. Um, and then... He persuaded 38 of his cult followers to commit suicide so that their souls could board the craft. So um, he believed that after their deaths, an un- unidentified flying object, UFO, would take... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, would take their souls to another, quote, level of existence above human, which he describes as being both physical and spiritual. Their final meal together... Here's one thing I just couldn't cut out because it was so good. Um, where did you go earlier in your story? On your Applebee's? Date? Applebee's? It's not Applebee's, but oh. it's close. Okay. They, they, their final meal, like right before they did this, they were like excited about it. And the waitress or the waiter was like, no, they all seem like in really good spirits. But here's the thing. They all ate the same thing. They all shaved the same way. They all did these things together. Like like a cult. Yeah. Um, and so they all ordered the same thing. They went to Marie Callender's. Nice. Yes. Loving it. Salad bar. Sometimes live piano. Good corn. Yeah. Here we go. Well, I'll tell you what they ate. Okay. They went to Marie Callender's in Carlsbad after party. I'll see you guys there. Yes. That Marie, I'm sorry, but that Marie Cal- Calendars and Carlsbad is fucking nuts. It's the best one. You go there, you drink white wine, like you have six white wines. Chablis. Uh, and then you just eat pie. 
It's amazing. <laughs> well, no, they ate iced tea, yawn, have a glass of wine, uh, dinner salads with tomato vinegar dressing. That sounds kind of nice. It is nice. And my favorite food, turkey pot pie. I like chicken, but I love pot pie, so I was pretty stoked on that. That was their, their final meal was turkey pot pie? Yeah. Marie Callender's in Carlsbad, California. <laughs> No, no, don't. This pot pie is crispy on the top. And crispy <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> See, that's why I got fired. No, I didn't. I quit. And they also had cheesecake with blueberries on top for dessert. Nice. Like, they had dessert. They're like, mm, let's go kill ourselves now. It's so I mean, crazy. Um, the waiter said no one seemed depressed at all or anything like that. <clears throat> so, uh, <laughs> Except for the one guy who was like, I wanted Snickers pie. <laughs> <laughs> And we have to all do the same thing. Yeah, every time. So the adherents, between the ages of 26 and 72, they died in three... 72? Yeah. It can't... might have been him that was 72. Oh, oh, they included him. I mean, I can't tell how old he is from that picture, but... Not young. Yeah. So here's what they did. They, they had three groups, um, and so each group would die on a different day, and the other ones would take care of them and clean them up and stuff. Oh, oh. So, I know, it's fucked up. So, March 21st, 24th, 38 Heaven's Gate members took phenobarbital mixed with applesauce mm -hmm. and washed it down with vodka, and then they put plastic bags around their heads after ingesting the mixture to induce asphyxiation. Yeah. So they were not fucking around. Yeah. Um... Right as you're pulling that bag on your head, you're like, I don't know. I know. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I know. That oh, bums me out it's, so much. It's, I remember seeing this on the news when it happened. Yeah. And those fucking, well, sorry, I don't want to jump, get to jump that. your thing, but. I actually oh, cut that part in. It's so intense. <laughs> you cut it in? <laughs> I cut it in. Okay, so they were found dead in their home on March 26, 1997, lying neatly in their each in their own bank beds and like imagine seeing this when you're a fucking teenager and on the news it was so insane it's just perfect everyone's perfect they're in these perfect bunk beds they all have um their faces and torsos are covered by s these perfect square purple cloths which the people who are still living put over them um they and they were all dressed in identical black shirts, sweat, black sweatpants, and brand new black and white Nike Decade athlete shoes. So that was like the crazy, like this fucking. We didn't have them then, but this meme of fucking back then. Yeah. Before memes were a thing. Yes, the original. And Nike was like, ugh, ugh, they discontinued the shoes. <laughs> yes, they did. And they yeah. actually, you can sell them for a lot. You can buy them for a shit. They sold like someone bought them for like a million dollars on <laughs> eBay. Fuck. Yeah. Murderino. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good the, call. The, I remember the thing that upset me with that video because it's such a it's such a walk through it's creepy, creepy video. Quiet. It's, it's it's totally uh, yeah. early Blair Witch, but um, to see adults in bunk beds is not cool <laughs> at all. Yeah. It's not that alone. Something's it, wrong. If they were just asleep and the police were like a bunch of adults slept in bunk beds, it'd be like, oh god, yeah. get me out of here. Yeah. But That's then they took it a step further. They did. Um, they each had a $5 bill and a, and a roll of quarters in their pockets, which was actually what they, when they would leave the house, they wouldn't, you know, they didn't have earthly possessions, but just in case they needed to use a bus or make a phone call, they would always bring a $5 bill and a roll of quarters. And someone was like, they did it as kind of a joke just to like have people find it. It's almost like they had a sense of humor about it because they didn't think they were killing themselves. They thought they were, you know, heading going, off to space. Going to the, God, that's awful. Spirit in the sky and all that. <laughs> uh. Yeah. And they also were super into Star Trek and, um. <laughs> just like you are. <laughs> just like me, who almost said Star Wars Star just now. Trek? Trek? I did like, listen. Look. Um, the next generation was my jam when I was a kid. It's good. It's so good. It's also very, this, it's all like pastels. It was very, it was very aesthetically yeah. pleasing to watch. And that Will Wheaton, I sure had a crush on him. Sure, he was wearing a bodysuit. How could you <laughs> deny him? <laughs> okay. And so they wore, they all had patches that said Heaven's Gate Away Team, which was a Star Trek fictional universe. God, these culture. people were funny. They were kind of clever and like cool. <laughs> it's so odd. So they had the distinction of being the first well-known cult in the internet era. And they um, actually, they made money designing websites for people. And that web fucking site is still up and running today. No. 
by two people who are like cult members who didn't kill themselves. Like the, they're the remaining two? Yeah. Well, there's probably more than that. Wow. But yes. Um, and... I, I just remember saying, didn't they all have shaved heads? Or am I combining that with some other cult? I don't know. Is, they were real low-key. Like, everything was very... Yeah, they all wore the same color outfits. They were all, you know, yeah. chill. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's your cult, Heaven's Gate, San Diego. You guys. <laughs> wow. So good. Do we have time, Vince? Vince is, Vince is saying wrap it up. Is it a wrap-up time? No, he's, he's making insane hand gestures that I totally don't under... I think it's a yes. Yes. He's going like this. <laughs> when I don't know what that means. We are going to have to work out hand gestures yeah. that we memorize yeah. and learn. I should know what my husband's like wild, insane gestures mean, but I don't yet, and I feel like... You don't. There's something wrong with her. We need to go to marriage. Encounter. Encounters. And learn each other's shit. Okay. <laughs> um, you, do I pick or do you pick? Oh, I don't know. I, like, can we get the house lights up yeah. and we're going to we get take a hometown? A look? I think we're going to do a hometown murder. We choose. Doesn't matter what you do. It's our <laughs> choice. You can do whatever you want. Ultimately, we, we choose. Hold on. Let's see. Uh, hold on. Okay. I love when a girl is pointing at her friend. Yeah, that's always good. That, that girl right there. Blondie. Uh-oh. She's drunk or terrified? She, she, oh, no. Are you mad that your friend pointed at you? Okay. <laughs> you right. had your hand in the, in the air. Hi. Hi, what's your name? What's your name? You, <laughs> Come here. You have to tell us your name. Lori. Hi, Lori. Say hi. hi. Say hi to Lori, everybody. <laughs> do you want to face that way? Deep breath. Okay, let's, we can do it this way. Oh my God. Yeah, do it this way. You can't read your notes. Can't read it. No. Oh, are you just texting? <laughs> oh, do that later. Do that later. You, first, you have to earn the photo by, ta- okay. by telling the yeah. story. Where are you from? San Diego. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Local girl. I just want you guys to know she has sparkles on her cheeks. So many sparkles. Very sparkly. Sparkly and twinkly. Okay. Where, so tell us your hometown. Take a deep breath. I'm yeah. Fine. You're, you you're great. And then go ahead and use that mic. <laughs> yeah. You can get shit wrong. Okay. No, I will get shit wrong. Okay, good. Um, we do too. Yeah. My heart is beating. Cleophas Prince Jr., the Claremont Killer. Oh, yes. Yes. Do you know that? No, tell yeah. me. Um, you seem fine. I can't I know, tell. You're, go- you're good. You seem totally normal. Pretend. You got to pretend. Well, just tell us how you're. How do you yeah. know this story? Seriously, yeah. right up here with these <laughs> with these motherfuckers. <laughs> these motherfuckers. Okay, so 1990. Mm-hmm. Um, my best friend was murdered by a serial killer. <gasps> okay. Well, that's probably why you were having a hard time talking about yeah. it. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. A little I, more so. Like, there's so many things going through my mind. Oh, honey. Um, it's okay. <laughs> Sweet baby Angel, Don't right? comfort her. It's your story. No, I, know, I know, I know. Okay, so, oh, I want to get it right. N- uh, January 1990, Tiffany Schultz murdered in a Claremont apartment, found by her boyfriend, I believe. January, then February, um, Janine Weinhold is her name, was murdered. Same apartment buildings. Um, she's about 20 years old. We found out. We hear it, we hear it, and we're like, oh my god, there's a fucking serial killer in our, in San Diego. Uh, my best friend at the time was like, oh my god, I'm gonna get killed by this guy. Mm. And I'm like, you're not gonna get killed, what are you talking about? She, and she always had a, a thing where she was afraid that her and her, um, mom were gonna get killed. Okay. Mm. So, yeah, it was weird. March goes by, we're good. <laughs> yeah. April, a, a girl named Holly Tarr who was visiting her brother, same Claremont apartment complex, murdered, stabbed to death Ugh. by... So then at that point, they um, figured it was somebody that was they knew. And then May, East San Diego, a woman named Elisa Keller, who was 38 years old. So these three girls were like in their 20s. Elisa Keller, 38 years old, was murdered. They didn't figure out it was the same person because East San Diego, yeah. like whatever. Um, she was murdered. She lived with um, in the apartment with her daughter. They didn't figure it out, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fast forward. So that's four people, right? Fast forward to September. So in the meantime, he was burglarizing people and stalking people, but not doing anything, whatever. So 
September 13th, Thursday, I get a fucking phone call from my other best friend's mom that says, you need to sit down, Amber was killed. Mm. I'm like, what? What are, you, what are you talking about? So Amber and I had been friends for a long time, and we had this like standing date that we would talk Mondays and Thursdays. It was kind of stupid, whatever, we were young. Um, and I had been calling her all day, because I had that kind of weird feeling. But um, anyway, so I was told she was killed, and they obviously knew that it was the same because of whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, is this making sense? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Is it? Totally. Yep. I feel like I'm just like... <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, just to let you know, just to let you know, as a live performer of almost 20 years, I've never heard an audience this quiet in my life. <laughs> like, this is... Th they just want you to. They want. They want you to share what you have to say, yeah. and they trust you, and they love you. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. <sighs> Never in a million years. I know. Never you're doing in a great. Million years. Okay, so I get the phone call, and it was. It, it was actually actually interesting. Sorry. Huh? Hi. Yeah. Um, because at the time it was a police investigation. They weren't releasing any names, and at the time. The, uh, my friend's stepdad, stepdad said, no, you can't, you, we have to tell these people, these girls, me and some uh, two other people, that, you know, we can't find out from the news. Yeah. So we were told, blah, blah, blah. My best friend, Amber, and her mom, Pamela Clark, she was 18 and, and Pam was 42, killed in their home by him. Oh, my God. Six people, San Diego. So then, fast forward, we didn't know what the fuck was going on. Who it was? We knew that they that he stalked his victims. February 1991, he was arrested Good. in San Diego, then let go, and then he went back to where he was from. He was originally from Alabama. Mm -hmm. Wait, sorry, why was sorry. he let go? Um, probably bail. I'm not really sure what happened. I don't know. I don't know. But he was arrested and then let go, and then he was able to go back to Alabama. So they probably couldn't hold him on anything. Like yeah, they didn't exactly. have exactly. They didn't okay. really know. So he went and home. Exactly. So then they figured out from DNA at that point that he was like the guy. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And then um, did they go and get him? They extradited him back. Yeah. They had the, um, the whole trial, and then he was convicted on all six, plus rape, because he raped one of the girls. Nice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And plus, like, a shit ton of burglaries and all this little fucking shit that he did. So he's and gone for good. He's in San Quentin. San Quentin. They yeah. always send him to San Quentin. I know, right? Yeah. 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 So he's there, still breathing air that belongs to all those women that he killed. So mm. thank you That's for telling amazing. us. No, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you guys amazing and hard it's one thing to tell a hometown story about a murder because it happened in your town it's a totally different thing to tell something that happened in your heart yeah. that's fucking very difficult you did a great job thank you for sharing that and it means a lot to us to know that somebody who is so close to the grief and pain of a, vi of a victim would listen to our podcast. Because yeah. that means we only want to do right. We know that comedy can be very irreverent and inappropriate sometimes when we're talking about victims. But we never want anyone to feel like that's what we're laughing at. We're just laughing about talking to each other. So it means a lot to us that you listen to our podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> she um, just goes beautiful <laughs> that sounded sarcastic when you said it but I meant it no it, it seemed like you meant it Thanks. wait um, were you being sarcastic yes um, you guys this has been a fucking yeah. incredible show thank you guys so much for being here it's it's very, you're such a huge crowd and you've been so awesome and then also so incredibly respectful and polite. Yeah. That was really beautiful yeah. and a really cool thing to see an incredible and show. feel. Yeah. Um, and you know what? Stay sexy. And <laughs> Bye, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.